Hi folks, welcome to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast by Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter. In this podcast, Gary shares everything about servant leadership, service leadership, authentic leadership, how to create high performance cultures, service excellence and life balance. Here's your host, Gary Ryan. Thank you, Sienna, for your lovely introduction. I'm really, really happy to be here this evening with Nicholas Witherick, who is the founder of Eagle Transformation Coaching, an ex-teacher for a period of time, and then had a bit of an epiphany and decided to get into his own consulting business around leadership, and there is an acronym for Eagle that will get Nicholas to share with us. So welcome to the podcast this evening, my time, morning, your time still over in the UK, Nicholas. Gary, thank you very much. Let me tell you, having hosted a podcast for 27, 30 weeks, whatever it is, this is only the second podcast I've been on. So I really appreciate you and thank you for having me on this uh, amazing platform. As you say, I'm Nicholas. Yeah, I'm in chatting to you from Oxford in England right now. We're just about in the morning, just before lunchtime. And um, yeah, I set up Eagle Transformational Coaching. Probably so many people told me at the worst time in the world to set up a business. I set up in the middle of what the world called this pandemic. And I, you're right, I taught for 10 years. I taught uh, religious studies, philosophy and ethics between 11 years old and sort of 18, 19, 20 years old, Middlesex University. And after that, I had a career change. I felt teaching was an amazing career. It Mm. was, it tapped into so many uh, emotional stimulus that people love, you know? children, um, investment in personality. But I always equated it a little bit like the prison officer. Eventually, the prisoner leaves, but the prison officer doesn't. And I was a bit like, do you know, I think my school days are done here. It was that (laughs) regime of I'm 40 and I can only pee between 12 and 12.20, or I can only eat between 11 and 11.15. So anyway, I jacked in teaching, having loved it, and then I moved into the heritage and culture of the UK. Yes. So I worked within a huge national charity and then I worked for one of the largest museums in central London. And that was another 10 years of my life gone. And you know, the pandemic hit and I just reevaluated things that were really important to me. And one of the things that has hit me throughout my life or been influential throughout my life is how I've been led as a follower and how I've led as a leader. And yes. naturally I thought, I, I took voluntary redundancy and I sat in my office at home and I thought, what am I going to do? And leadership was the obvious thing for me. And I launched Eagle Transformational Coaching. And you know what? It was like standing in the wilderness and shouting for the first seven, eight, nine months. I was like, oh, yes. have I done the right thing? And now, two and a half, three years on, I am flat out. I'm flat That's out fabulous. with just this amazing... Um, comprehension that's dawning on everyone that leadership is changing leadership has changed and how do I tap into that so yeah that's taken me you know in the last sort of two and a half years really well you were also an author of the book the life I lead uh, which has been very successful uh, on Amazon could you tell us a little bit about that what inspired it uh, a little bit of a uh, an explanation of what the book's actually about because no doubt that's been a big piece of your coaching as well yeah, it started really as a bit of a whim. I um, I got in touch with a, a publisher and said, listen, I'm thinking about writing this book. And they were like, oh, well, there's a huge backlog. And, you know, a publisher, like, it's really difficult. But he was so supportive. He was brilliant. And he inspired me. And he just said, listen, do an hour and a half a day. And in 12 weeks, yes. you'll have a book. That's what, they, that's what they said. And the book really came out of reflections. You know, part of setting up this business. I spent a lot of time on platform, speaking at conferences. I spent a lot of time in team building environments. I spent a lot of time one-to-one coaching. And I thought, you know, it's very difficult not to stand there and just recount stories or recount reflections. So what I did was I thought, I'm going to put this book together and make the connectivity between the life you lead, the title of the book, and leadership. And it was basically, people struggle with so much in leadership that they take for granted in life. We're all husbands, partners, wives, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters. And all those skills we use to navigate life are really exactly the same skills we use in leadership. Intuition, initiative, passion, honesty, transparency. And we use them without thinking about it with our children, with our parents. You know, as our par- my parents are now 86 and I have to be slightly 
you know, covert and coy to keep them on the track. I use the same skills in my leadership at the office. Surely I've got to encourage people, entice people and influence people subtly, covertly, intuitionally. So that was the book. It came about the life I lead creating effective leadership. And look, one of the reasons why your book, your passion for the leadership space, what I do in the leadership space and what others are doing is so important is um, the research that came out of Jack Zenger and Harvard back in 2012 that indicated that at that time, leaders weren't getting any training until they were 42 years of age on average, and yet they were starting their formal leadership journeys in a workplace where they've got people reporting to them in their early Mm. 30s. And last year I reached out to Jack to see if that research had been updated, and he told me, Nicholas, yes, it has. And I said, great, what is it? You know, what... Has it gone down? Has it gone up? Has there been an impact from by COVID? He said, Gary, the average age is now nearly 47 years of age. Mm. It's actually yeah. gotten bigger, the gap, not smaller, which means despite the fact that people are still starting that leadership journey in their early 30s on average, which means a lot of people are obviously starting a lot um, earlier as well. That means that people are messing with other people's lives for a long period of time, including their own life when they don't have some clarity around what they they do, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is why, again, what you're doing uh, through Eagle, and it's probably a good opportunity to explain the acronym for Eagle to folks at the moment, Nicholas. I think this, I will, and I think it's a really interesting point, Gary, where we use leadership. And I think what's beginning to manifest itself is So much of what we've relied on in society generally in in 10, 15, 20 years time is not going to work in the same format. You know, I say this a lot and I've got a lot of naysayers who who, who disagree with me. In the UK, we have this amazing machine called the NHS where we have free medical care at the point of need. You know, we're beginning to hit that curve where we're coming to the realisation this is not sustainable. We can't sustain this. You know, when I was teaching... Uh, up until sort of 2008 you know I look at teaching I look at children I look at society I look at the the way we want citizens now that sort of in England particularly this Dickensian Victorian way in which we create citizens is not sustainable and I think leadership's the same the way in which we form leaders now if we're impacting leaders at four in their 40s and not in their 20s we've got this huge mountain that's coming down the track that's going to derail us You know, I set up Eagle Transformational Coaching and I thought the the core values of people's lives that are transferable into people's offices are Eagle. E, empower. How do I feel empowered and how do I empower other people? Acquisition. A, what skills do I need to immediately acquire to become an effective leader? And what skills do I need to make available to my team for them to acquire in order to be effective followers? E-A-G, growth. In what areas of my life do I need to grow? And this is really tough. This is stuff that we need to grow in in our marriages and our partnerships and our parenting. Transparency, honesty, integrity, authenticity. Those sort of lifelong journeys that can be really tough to manage. L, launch. You know, we're in the society of hedonistic quick wins. I want it now. I want to complain and have that resolved now. I want this product now. Why is Amazon doing so well? Because we deliver it in London within two hours. I want my takeaway food now. I want my interest on my account now. I want it now. But that misses out this huge concept of whatever I launch now, how does it get legs? How does it have a longevity? So if I'm launching an initiative, how do I get my team behind me? How do I get that vision clearly laid out? Where's the longevity in that launch? And lastly, evolve, evolution. What I am now needs to be able to flex and morph and pivot and change to say, this is my contingency of budget. This is my contingency of team. This is my contingency of time. Whatever that is, we need to build that in. You know, people are afraid of risk and half of our evolution is risk. If I'm adverse to risk, that means that I haven't actually looked at all the options that are on the table. You know, there might be options on there that I think, you know, these are really terrible options that I want to avoid them. But if they're on the table, we know there are possibility. So evolution, how do I evolve? And one of the thing about all of your questions there, Nicholas, is they're, they're, they're questions, they're five questions that the person is asking themselves. Yeah. 
they're asking, they're catalyzing the questions. And it's an interesting aspect about the development question because one of the, the things about that stat I just shared about um, it being 47 before leaders are developed is that's the truth when the leaders are waiting for someone else to ask the question of them about their development rather than them actually asking those five questions that you're suggesting with Eagle for themselves anyway. Because you can develop yourself as a leader even if the organisation isn't doing anything because there is so much available out there in terms of help, coaching, mentoring. If you're prepared to invest in yourself, I mean, I always wonder to myself, why, why is it that folks who have taken on a leadership role must go home with headaches because of it? And yet they're still waiting for the organization to develop. And clearly a good organization would develop you. But there's a lot of organizations that don't. But why wait anyway? You're going to be better off for it. You'll be better, as you said right at the outset, in the various life roles. You, you'll be a better wife, a better husband, a better sister, a better son, a better daughter, a better uncle, auntie, community member, whatever the case may be. Um, so taking on that personal responsibility and accountability, I, I, I think I'm hearing is accurate, is a big part of what Eagle is about. Absolutely right. Without without drawing uh, a particular faith into this, it's a little bit like the bloke who's drowning in the ocean and, you know, a helicopter comes, no, 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 God's going to save me. A lifeboat comes, no, no, God's going to save me. Yeah. And eventually this guy drowns and he gets to heaven and God's like, well, I sent you a helicopter. I sent you a lifeboat. You know, you didn't get on either of them. We're a bit like that. And, it, and I use yeah. this analogy that so many people, as being a good leader is vital. You know, what makes leadership successful in its totality, not in its various fragments, in its totality, is this avoidance of a paranoia that a lot of people will follow the norm and they'll stand at that water cooler and they will drip, drip, drip neg negativity at leadership, mm. at an organisation, at a tradition. And as soon as you get a hint of feeling of that, if you feel it in your gut, if you feel it in your water, I can guarantee you it's happening. If you think... I'm not sure that they're going to go to that water cooler and slag me off, then I can guarantee you it's happening. You know, if you're a leader right. listening to this and you feel like that, then it's happening. And that is so yeah. important. You know, if you, are, if you are leading and you're not learning, if you are leading and you're not reading, if you are leading and not upskilling, then believe me, your leadership has a very finite period of leadership in it. You're absolutely right, Gary. And I think this phenomenon... Is going to watch going to change leadership in the next decade. You know the transition for people leading now virtually. The transition for for leaders leading people who are not just remote workers but flexi workers that are working in their home countries. That has changed leadership. You know it's the it's the headmaster of the school who's not in his office, so the yes. pupils can run right because there's nobody to be sent to. And that's the feeling that leaders have. There is, I've got leadership without um, authority. I've got leadership without power. Or I've got leadership without tactile management. And that's quite, that's quite difficult for some leaders. Oh, no doubt. I mean, uh, one of the clients that I uh, actually interviewed recently uh, shared that at one point in time, he had 1,000 people globally reporting directly to him. 1,000 yeah. people. Which yeah. is... I don't believe that can work personally. <laughs> Agreed. But it's completely yeah. ineffective. It's completely ineffective. And any organization that thought a structure like that could work is, is, is missing the whole point of what human beings actually are and the fact that, yes, we can be remote, yes, we can be in different time zones, but we're still a social creature, right? Yeah. Now, interestingly, with, with what you were talking about, about, you know, you've got to learn, you've got to read, etc. cetera, um, one, of, one of my sayings is that, you know, you have to feed, what, what are you feeding your mind? And on one level, you know, I like to call the mind the beast. And from a neuroscience point of view, we still fundamentally are a mammal, right? We still fundamentally are an emotional, irrational creature, which has enabled us to survive and thrive in this world. So I'm not saying that in a bad way, but it's still a beast. And, yep. you know, you have to be consciously feeding your, your beast positivity. Yes. You know, optimism. Uh, skills and knowledge to help you navigate in the complex world that we live in. Because otherwise, not only will that negativity happen around that water cooler, you'll be the one 
catalyzing the negativity yourself. Absolutely What's your perspective right. on that? Absolutely right. And I think, you know, I only interviewed somebody on my podcast um, who was talking about conscious leadership. And I love this yes. subject. Gary, I think it's an amazing subject. You're right. Phil, what are you filling your space in your head with? And what I've discovered is a lot of people find that a little intimidating. They, they consider the conscious leader this belief that, what well, am I? Am I of course I'm conscious, you know, I get on the bloody train, I drive to work, of course I'm conscious, but, and we take it for granted, this sort of conscious leader, and I would change that word for people thinking, I don't know what the bloody hell he's on about, to intent, what is your intention, what are you filling this hour, this day, this meeting, this one-to-one, -one, this appraisal, this team meeting, this project, what is your intention, and swap that consciousness that we as coaches use, and that we as, you know, we do it, we do it, everyone does it, but for people struggling to concept that, do it with intention. If you don't create intention, then you yes. won't create anything effective. My intention in this, you know, um, environment of conflict is to create some appeasement and peace. My intention in this environment of apathy is to create some passion. Start with what is your intention in your leadership, in your followership, and that will create an effective intention environment consciousness yes for success how to achieve life harmony and fulfillment is my new book it's out now check out the link in the show notes for all the details of how to get the new book yes for success how to achieve life harmony and fulfillment it's going to teach you a whole heap of strategies around how to have increased happiness now and into the future for your life if not for you get it for someone else that might be struggling or floating along in life this book works and as you can see folks the book debuted at number six on amazon so people have reacted to it very positively check it out you can get your copy too now let's get back to the interview with nicholas and you know that there's layers to that from a really practical sense it's what's my intention today What's my intention this week, this month, this year? What's my intention in this meeting? What's my intention in this conversation? There's, you know, having that, that, that trigger, if you like, of intentionality is very, very powerful for focus, for yes. drawing on the yes. intuition that you need to be able to be functional and effective in that particular moment, whatever it might be. So it's a very, very powerful tip that you're sharing there, Nicholas. And I'd be interested in... You, you use the iceberg metaphor in some of your work, and I use it in some of my work. We use it slightly differently, but in terms of the intention and consciousness, you know, one of the one of the realities for us human beings is, in fact, a lot of our behaviour is driven through con subconscious um, mindsets or paradigms yeah. that we've got, yeah. but we don't know. We're not actually conscious of that we've got them. So, for example, you were talking about the leader needing to learn. A lot of leaders, if, if their mindset says, I need to look like I know everything because that's why I'm getting paid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if I admit I don't know something on this list of things of which that I believe I'm supposed to know, then I'm not justifying the money I'm getting paid. So I better, as the saying goes, fake it till I make it, <laughs> which yeah. is a very unfortunate yeah. term in my view. And it's been taught to a lot of people to do that when in fact, maybe... It be explicit about the fact that I'm learning until I make it. Yeah, absolutely right. There are two things I'd like to pick up on in that, Gary. Really interesting points and really good questions. I hate the phrase, fake it until you make oh. it. I love the phrase, manifest in it to believe it. If I believe something, you know, I spent, yes. let me tell people, when I set up this organisation, bearing in mind I had worked in one of the busiest international museums in central London for 10 years, and I found myself in my study now, and I was sat here for days, and I was popping out on social media, which I'd never belonged to in my life. I was sending emails that I to random people that had never heard of me. And I sat here thinking, you know, Nicholas, you've got to, you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it and it will build it and it will come. They will come, you know, that sort of, I'm going to believe it and it will manifest. That's completely different to bullshit your way through and it will happen that yes. you turn out to be great. That is rubbish. Fake it till you make it does not work. But there are two things no. I think that people need to pick up on. One is that that immediate intention for this meeting, 
for this uh, altercation, for this encouragement, for this project is is the first step. Everyone needs to learn to do that. Create an intention. That's creating a consciousness. And as that skill develops, then what you become is that visionary, that strategist, where what you are intentionally doing in this meeting is because you know where you want to be in two years time in one year's time in one month time so they don't become siloed isolated intentions they become an intention of habit of second nature of this is where we're organically going to grow to so i think that's really important the second point i'd want to make is that people who want to lead and have a passion to lead are better often than people who are solely good at their job. And one of the defaults we make in leadership is that we think, you know, that guy's a great salesman, that guy's a great retainer of workforce, that guy's great with budget, that guy's great with project Gantt charts, but they can absolutely be terrible at leadership. And yes. it, it's, a, it's gonna be a huge pitfall where we end up with product, productivity, and ROI over leadership, people skills, empathy, compassion. You know, people wince at the word compassion. It just means with love. It just means with conviction. You know, what am I involved yes. in that drives me with excitement, that drives me that I'm gonna, you know, we're passionate about our children, even though at times we bloody hate them. We're passionate about our wives and partners, even though we bloody hate them at times. It's finding that skill that people look at the dog at the end of the night and know that dog needs to go outside for a wee. It's that intuition <laughs> that knows that that dog thinks it's supper time. Dog doesn't talk, but we receive those messages subliminally, oh, subconsciously. Yeah. You know, and yet we don't use that same intuition in the office. You know, Maureen looks at me in the office and I'm just blank. I don't know what to think. The, and she's talking at me. She's, she's, she's communicating and I'm still missing it. The dog just yeah. looks at me. I know it either needs a wee or it needs food or it needs something. So we don't make that transferable skill. And I think you're absolutely right. This will come and haunt us. Yeah, Russell Ackoff, who was this, um, um, the, the Wharton Business School's um, professor emeritus, he, he's passed away now, but he said that ages don't die. They just fade in and fade away. And, and one of the challenges we've got with industrial age thinking, which is you sort of referenced before, is this idea of someone being skillful in something therefore makes them a good leader. And unfortunately, what the industrial age thinking along those lines has done, Nicholas, is it's tied payment to this set of skills of management and getting more money because by becoming a leader. And that yeah. forces people to go, well, I want to get the pay rise, so I'll go into a job that I know I'm not any good at, but the system says that's the only way you can earn more money because it's not respecting the people skills to the same level as the technical skills when we'd be better off if someone's great at leading pay them well for leading if someone's yes. great for their technical yes. skills let them remain with those technical skills and pay them well for that too both have significant value that needs to be paid differently but possibly at the same level does that make sense yes it, it makes absolute sense and i think one of the cruxes is in this in this post-pandemic um, European war era of monumental um, cost of living crisis. Yes. Do you know people's um, people's motivation is n is less and less being anchored on salary, pay, and bonus. You know, I challenge a lot of leaders who say, you know, I can't retain staff. I can't retain staff. We're we're losing people at a rate quicker than we can replace them. And I'm saying, what are you what are you motivating them with? What are you what are you remunerating them with? And their answer is cash, you know, cash. What used to be a £30,000 job is now a £90,000 job. And it's like, well, that doesn't matter. Have you offered flexibility of hours or location? Have you offered volunteering days? Have you offered non-compulsory days of leave over festivities? Have you offered religious holidays on paid leave? You know, what have you offered outside of cash? Why? Because people are plugging into the fact that my life is actually more important than $10 an hour or $15 an hour. My life is more important than one windfall at the end of January. You know, my life is about my children growing up, my ill parents, my aging sister, my, you know, disabled child. This is where my life is. And if you can't work around that, 
then actually I can't be passionate in the role I'm doing. I can't work in the role I'm doing. And the other thing I think is important is, you know, when people find something in an organisation they don't like, they just challenge it. All they do is moan about it. You know, we're, we're so relaxed about moaning about our governments, moaning about our royal family, moaning about our presidency, moaning about our military, our transport, our health care. But the risk of doing that is we lose the voice that has the initiative to replace it with something better. Don't just challenge yes. it. Let's come up with something that's going to replace it that's better. And then what is existing now will become obsolete. It will disappear. Yes. You know, yeah. catalogues that put my grandmother and mother used to flick through where they'd order a shower cap. And it was just the same as Amazon. It would just take a week to get here. Now it'll be here the same day. Why? Because they've made that catalogue obsolete. They haven't changed the concept. They've challenged it and made it obsolete. And that's what we need to start doing. Before we start mouthing off about things, what are we going to replace it with? What are we going to suggest yeah. that might streamline it, make it better for everybody? And that's, I think, is a huge challenge for people at the water cooler slagging the life off. And it's, it's why people need to really consider spending some time on themselves and leading themselves first. Whether you're in a formal leadership role or not, which sort of winds us back to where we were talking at the start, Nicholas, is, is that... In this very fast-paced world that we lived in, so yes, catalogs don't exist anymore. You can get it instantaneously because we came up with a new way. One of the, the challenges we've got in the world is the bite-sized nature of people wanting to consume anything yeah. actually prevents people from going to any level of depth of understanding who on earth they actually are. Who am yeah. I? Yeah. Because when, when you've done that work, you become far clearer at what your talents are and what your passions are. And as a result of that, you actually have an opportunity to find work that's at that intersection. And when yeah. you've got work that's at the intersection of your talents and passions, there is more to what than, than the pay to the work because there is a higher purpose that I'm able to connect to that gives me meaning for the, the work that I might be doing. And I think that's something that leaders could be helping staff understand better for themselves. You know, maybe we are in an era where organisations need to be saying to staff, hey, we're going we're to put you in some, some deep learning around who you are to understand who you are better as part of the benefit of being an employee here. Absolutely. We're going to help you understand yourself better. And we're going to actually help m help you manifest your own career, sometimes potentially taking you away from us. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's actually better for you and better better for us, right? It's, it's one of the reasons why I'm just about to launch my book, Yes for Success, How to Achieve Life Harmony and Fulfillment, which is a, a basically a life planning pr program, uh, Nicholas, yeah. which is really about people having some clarity about where am I going, that intention at the big level that you were sort of discussed earlier, but equally about understanding the progress I'm making today so I can also be happy today. I don't have to have happiness all in the future because both yeah. can coexist at the same right. time, but I would argue both are not sustainable without each other. I would, I would absolutely agree with you. And I think that book, Yes for Success, that you're just about to launch, is a key question that people need to ask themselves. I'm a great believer in, you know, people create in the States or Australia, they might call it a resume, we call it a CV here, it's a curriculum vitae, Latin for my qualification, my life of qualification. You know, and that, that details my school, my degrees, my accolades, my badges, my pins and caps and gowns. And I say to people, before you start writing your resume, start writing your curriculum vitae, start by just writing your vitae. What are your passions? What are your motivators? Yes. What are your core values? What are your skills? What are your talents? What are your yearnings inside you? What are your knowledges about yourself? How do you react to anger? How do you react to love? How do you react to joy? Mm. You know, what are your triggers for all of those emotions? Write that stuff down, first of all, before you start saying, mm. because once you write that down, then you look at your resume, you're like, you know, these two are just poles apart. <laughs> you know, I'm managing director and I'm a this, that and the other, but actually I'm quite vulnerable. Actually, I'm quite frightened. Actually, I'm quite insecure. I don't have a lot of confidence. Mm. And these two are just like poles apart. And unless you marry yes. those two together, whatever you do is either going to kill you, you're going to burn out and stress and die, yeah. or it's going to seep into every relationship outside of work that you have. You know, if you're stressed yeah. at work, the first person who's going to receive that is either your children or your partner. 
If you're happy at work, the first person you're going to receive that is either your children or your partner. And we don't make that correlation at the moment. So you're right. Yes to success is, is what is the yes? What is driving me? And I think that's a key question. Yeah, it absolutely is. And again, it's, it requires people to be doing that work, the, the eagle work, if you like, from, from your organization on themselves so that they can understand who I am, but being, being prepared to invest that. And, and one of the mindsets that's a, it's a barrier, I think, to people doing it is that they think that that work is work. It, yeah. And as a result of it being work, if I do it outside of work, therefore, I'm not spending time on my life. But actually, I don't know that you can separate them. <laughs> I think they're one Absolutely. and the same thing. And, and, if, and if you're doing work on yourself and, and you're, you're, you're working on your passions and you're, you're learning, like when, when you're reading and I'm reading, is that work or is that just us being ourselves and living in a great space? I, there is this... I think there it's is the this there's this ridiculous belief that I will hit a certain age, a certain salary, a certain zip code, postcode, a certain size property, a certain badged car, a certain credit card, and I have hit the jackpot. I am now in a position in my life where I can cruise. Out. And that's okay. That was okay for my father's generation. My father's 86, you know, professional guy, captain in the Merchant Navy, and they hit this pattern. That does not work in this day and age. That doesn't work for my generation. It doesn't work for my daughter's generation. You know, the world in which we live in does not have this coasting. It doesn't have that I have reached it. Because if you do and you stagnate, then you lose yes. You lose that drive to discover who you are. So many people will live their life below par of potential just because, God, you know, I've got a gold Amex card. I've got 42,000 air miles with BA. You know, I've got a... I've got a six-figure salary i've now got a company bmw all that is bollocks unless you know who yes. you are yourself now along those lines for people to know who you are nicholas what's going to be some of the best ways for them to contact you uh when they listen into the show and we can put all the contact details into our show notes absolutely um you can contact me on the website www.eagletransformationalcoaching.com you can get hold of me directly at transform at eaglecoach.business or you can get hold of my team at admin.eaglecoach.business uh, and obviously there's LinkedIn and, and all the other social medias that I'm not okay with Gary but they're there, they're there for people to plug in. The book's on Amazon, I'd recommend it. Uh, you know, it's an easy read, you'll, you'll, you'll read it in a couple of hours and if you're thinking I need to just look at the way I lead or follow, then you need the book. Is all I can say. Yeah, um, there, that's the, the life I lead. Yeah, Check it out yeah. On Amazon folks. Yeah. Can absolutely. they get a hard copy from you directly if they wanted to as well? Absolutely. Or just no, you can email me or email my team. We'll get a copy to you. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem. There's that's also fantastic. a course which I'd say, Gary, on the website. Yes. There's a course called Below the Tip of the Iceberg. And it's not that I want to plug it. I just want people to be aware of it because I think it's a really good introduction for people to say, how do I make that connectivity between my life and my workplace? Below the tip of the iceberg, and it talks about those eagle acronyms, empower, acquire, grow, launch, evolve. Good introduction for people to have a goosey. Well, I'm happy for you to plug it because if you don't plug it, they don't know about it. If they don't know about it, they can't use it. If they can't use it, they're not going to do what we've been talking about all night. So just give it one more plug, one more plug. Give that course a plug. Yeah, below the tip of the iceberg, it's on the website, eagletransformationalcoaching.com. It's an introduction to those five skills that you can navigate, that you subconsciously and consciously use in life to transfer immediately, really tangibly, really easily with practical uses into your workplace. Yeah, because we're not in competition. We're, we're, we're in the same space. And we're, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, it's about helping each other out. There's 8 billion people on this planet. So there's more than enough opportunity for us and, to be sure. And 8 billion of which are in a position of leadership or followership. One way or another, 100%, because they've got to lead themselves. Uh, and yeah. again, that's why I've got Yes for Success, because it's about you've got to start here. And it's one of yeah. the things for, for leaders in a formal place, if you haven't started here first, if you haven't worked on yourself first, you're going to find leading other people is going to stop you from sleeping. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Nick, Nicholas, I really want to thank you for joining us on the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. I look forward to folk uh, commenting and liking and subscribing to the podcast. I want to thank you for joining us in the, the early morning, your time in the UK. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Gary. Honestly, I would love to continue this conversation. I'm going to flip you onto the life I lead and we'll, we'll carry it on. But it's been a great privilege. Thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. It sounds like I uh, will be booking myself in for the Life I Lead podcast too. So with that, folks, thanks for joining us on the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. I'm Gary Ryan, your host. Please like and subscribe to our podcast. Give us a review on any of the platforms because that does make a difference. It is important for us to do so. If you'd like to get on our email list, please go to orgsthatmatter.com slash newsletter. Once again, I'm Gary Ryan from the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast, and we look forward to the next episode. Bye.